Bill Moses, um, thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited to have you on Outlier Founders. Thanks for making time. Thanks for being here, Daniel. Appreciate it. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to talk about Kavita, which is a company that you founded, ended up selling to PepsiCo in 2016. We're going to talk about a bunch of investing and advising you've done and uh, really interesting brands like Iconic Protein, Wild Brands, Koya, um, Vive, um, a bunch of interesting companies. And then we're going to talk about the company that you're building today, which is Flying Embers, which is all around this kind of fermented beverage, better for you concept, which is really interesting. And so where I want to start is if you could just give people a quick sketch of your background. And, and a little bit of the journey that you've had. Sure. Let's see how far we want to go back. Oh, I, I think we'll start with uh, uh, school at UVA, a little bit overseas uh, adventure in uh, at the south of France at the American University where I learned about fermentation and winemaking. And then uh, fast forward to New York City, uh, Wall Street, 10, 12, year, 12 years, uh, Bear Stearns to partnership on the street, which still exists. Uh, Went ahead and uh, moved to California. Several different business deals I was doing. I uh, got into investment banking uh, and, uh, and and merchant banking, and ended up uh, investing in a company in China. Uh, George Soros was a finance uh, financed, and uh, that was a technology company uh, back in eighty nine and ninety. Believe it or not, when I was over there in my twenties, and uh, uh, had an exit there and got into winemaking and learning about fermentation at my property in Ojai, California, went ahead and uh, again, some other business deals and transactions, uh, nothing really worth uh, uh, mentioning necessarily. Uh, I did, although I did start a cable television network uh, that was actually called the Recovery Network or Arnett Health, uh, ended up getting Liberty Media and TCI, ended up selling it to Liberty Media. And that was a, a interesting uh, run. Then all of a sudden I was into food and beverages. I was really wanting to live off the earth. I was, you know, cultivating my my property in Ojai, uh, planting, making it a permaculture. It was certified organic. I planted all sorts of grapes and fruit trees and all that. And I was in love with California moving, coming from New York City, right? So anyway, I uh, started the first certified organic winery in the central and southern California coast and, you know, really learned that you could really make wine organically, uh, without a uh, compromise of flavor or quality. And, you know, was fortunate enough to win some gold medals at some open competitions, uh, San Francisco International and Chronicle Wine Competitions. And that really got me into fermentation. I was like, well, I really love to watch this, this alchemy, this magic, this, this special process that really uh, transcended anything that was... Uh, part of the ordinary uh, sort of realm of life, you know, this whole, this whole thing of fermentation. So I fell in love with it. And anyway, then um, actually my wife's a friend, best friend, developed a drink called Kavita uh, Water Kefir. And we partnered up and I got behind her. We started to, we raised money, we built manufacturing, we refined the product. I then... And then we were, it was, we were the antithesis of heart of uh, kombucha because we were a water kefir, which is a different kind of ferment. It's a lacto ferment that's much softer anyway. But all of a sudden I was like, Hey, you know what? Um, let, let's go ahead and develop a hard kombucha. So with some other guys I, I brought in, uh, Nate Patina and John Ballas, uh, you know, they went ahead and they went ahead and developed this amazing, uh, kombucha product that complemented chakra as water kefir. And next thing you know, an investment banker came to me and said, you know, PepsiCo is really looking for better for you. And we got PepsiCo to invest. And uh, anyway, there's a story there about how to actually get a strategic on the cap table. It's not easy. I'll save that. But then fast forward from there, I went ahead and sold Pepsi, uh, sold Kavita to PepsiCo. Use that cred and some cash to go ahead and identify great entrepreneurs, great opportunities, great on trend products, invested in a bunch of those, sat on the still sit on the board of several of those. Some of those have transacted and exited. And during that time or shortly thereafter, I was like, you know, I really want to I really want to do it again. And a lot of my uh, advisors and friends were like, look, you know, building a brand and doing it once is like enough. You know, you don't need to do it again. And I just wanted to get to get in the mix. And that's when I started Fermented Sciences. Um, which is a platform for better for you alcohol, adult beverages. And out of that, we launched from uh, Flying Embers initially as a hard kombucha company, hard kombucha product offering. 
we immediately jumped into the, the at the time, the hot trend of uh, a hard seltzer. And then, uh, and then most recently, you know, we've gotten into fermented canned cocktails, a margarita and a mojito. So that's really the abbreviated uh, bio. I mean, that's prolific. You <laughs> covered an enormous amount of, I think, fascinating, interesting ground there. You know, one of the things, I guess I had two follow-up questions. One was, you know, you brought up obviously learning and I guess spending more time with fermentation on this winery that you have in Ojai. And is there a name for the winery that people can find and buy the wine under? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Casa Barranca. And uh, that means we'll link to that. The routine. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. That's, uh... Yeah. We will link to that. Um, but one of the things you kind of hinted at, you know, just really briefly is that you studied in France and it sounds like some of that was fermentation. Um, obviously, since fermentation is going to come around kind of full circle, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this talking about flying embers. I think it'd be interesting to kind of talk about that. Give us just a little bit more information about how you learned about fermentation, you know, back in France and maybe how that influenced. Yeah. So I was at the American University and, uh, Ultimately, my learning came from the garage. I was living with a French family in Aix-en-Provence outside uh, the city, and they were garage winemakers. And uh, I would, on the weekends, participate, watch them make it. We would, you know, we would drink wine every day. We'd have wine and we'd, uh, and I just really fell in love with, uh, with the process. And, and it really became, and I was obviously in the great French French regions and traveled throughout France and Spain and Italy. And at that point, I knew that some at some point in my life, I was going to get back into that. And but I didn't have any any idea that it would be where I ended up today. Yeah. How hard is it? And this may be a difficult question for you to answer. But when I hear garage wine in France, I think both, wow, that sounds amazing. And oh, that's probably could be terrible. <laughs> terrible. I you know, have friends that have tried to make beer and wine. And it, you know, it's a very trying process. How difficult was it to make great fermented wine in a garage like in France? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, it's, it's sort of the, the garage winemaker is a term uh, in France. And they're, they're really the rebels against sort of the established sort of viticultural uh, sort of uh, regions and society. But they're great wines. Some of them are really great wines. So I learned the handcraft small boutique method that I think you couldn't learn at UC Davis uh, learning, you know, enology, or you couldn't learn working for a large uh, vineyard or winery. So actually, I think it was really the most beneficial life experience I had, period. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, I want to start today. Again, we're going to cover a bunch of ground. And so I'm going to try to, we're going to move through a lot because <laughs> um, you've got a fascinating background. I want to try to tie it all together. But I want to start with Kavita. You know, and you talked about it at the beginning, it sounds like your wife's friend had developed this water kefir and that the fermentation was very different from kombucha. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of weave all of this together. And so maybe the question I wanted to ask is kind of take people listening back to 2009. What existed was, was you know, kombucha, had it taken off, had it kind of reached mainstream? And then what was so different about Kavita compared to something like kombucha? So in 2009, there was a, you know, there was a brand... GT Dave, and uh, who I know and respect hugely, immensely, he's an amazing, amazing entrepreneur, um, and and he was the dominant kombucha player, not hard kombucha, excuse me. You know, we saw that with hard with kombucha, when we were drinking it as uh, new to the category, and that would be me and my early co-founders. You know, we thought it was kind of harsh and tart and got a little rank and it was very live and wild. And we just thought, wow, there's got to be a way of doing this better. So like I said, Chakra developed a, a water kefir, which we positioned as the antithesis of kombucha. But yet a probiotic, prebiotic, live fermented drink that can really help people and benefit people. And so we went out and marketed that. And we got placements next to them and we carved out our niche, but ultimately the category was really kombucha. And as much as we thought differentiating it and sitting next to it was the, the playbook, learning and knowing and seeing that is what gave me the impetus to, I wouldn't say pivot, but quickly realize that we should make, we should do another line extension. And we did, and it was a kombucha that actually complemented our, our water kefir. And, uh, 
And that was a really interesting moment where, you know, dogmatism and intransigence of what you believe is right and whatnot needs to sometimes alter based on looking at category development and, and how you fit within that category or not. Yeah, I think that's one of the most difficult aspects of being an entrepreneur is you clearly are building something that you believe needs to exist, should exist. And yet you also have to balance that with extreme humility and openness and mental flexibility to like listen and take in the data that says you're wrong and be able to be able to pivot in that example. I want to ask a, a question, you know, and maybe just to kind of parrot this back. So it sounds like your experience of drinking kombucha for the very first time reminds me of my experience. I remember being in San Francisco. I had never heard of kombucha before. And I want, you know, I think I got it in a Whole Foods store. And I remember going home and trying it and just being like, literally, what is, you know, what is this? Like, and, and it was a GT kombucha, which I drink today. But I remember, you know, it's got this like live kombucha culture on the bottom. There's just, it's a very, very, very different drink. And so, I, you know, to me, it makes a lot of sense to come in and say, it's got to be something that's different. The question I wanted to ask is, you know, so you kind of take this water kefa, you go to compete with GT, you realize, okay, people really want kombucha. How does that influence Kavita's kombucha product? So what we wanted to do was, you know, take more of a scientific approach. And, and at that time we had got, we had gotten Pepsi invested. And of course with Pepsi on the board and really I was working with their teams uh, to what they wanted to see was a product that we had a, had a, had a standardized nutritional fact panel. It wasn't something that was moving around because it was live and ferment. And so, you know, really thinking through a scalable, how do we take a raw, organic, naturally fermented product, water kefir and kombucha, and make it into something that could be manufactured and commercialized with reliability and consistency around quality assurance so that we were compliant and not being considered an alcoholic product. So that was really where we rolled up our sleeves and began to ideate around a product that first, like I said, flavor first, really met the expectations of a kombucha drinker. It had a high TA, a high, a lot of organic acid, but yet didn't have some of the other aspects or attributes of it that would normally turn off a mainstream consumer, like the floaties in it. Uh, that's called that's called a pellicle. Uh, pellicle is really the off product of the bacteria and yeast. It's kind of like anyway. So I don't want to get into details, but but so we we decided we don't need that, and then we decided that you know we really want to make it so that it's more shelf stable. The kombucha was actually shelf stable. The water kefir wasn't. We could be shelf stable, and that was really important. And so anyway, long story short, we we wanted to match the expectation of the existing kombucha drinker yet make it more mainstream where there wasn't anything that could be polarizing so that we could extend the category beyond the early adopters that were drinking GT because trying to pull any GT drinker away, he had a halo. He, you talk about a badge, you talk about all those great marketing, like he had that. So we wanted to leverage the reputation of kombucha in a way of expanding the category. And we did, and we ended up making something unique and different that complemented the existing folks on shelf. And that became the big, that became a much bigger uh, product line than either the water kefir or the apple cider vinegar, which were the other two lines. Yeah, that makes sense. And I want to ask a question and, and come back to PepsiCo in a second and talk about how you got them on as an investor and talk a little bit about the process of then selling to them. But I want to ask a different question, which is, you know, so it, just hearing you talk there, it sounds like you, I won't regurgitate what we said before, but you start with water kefir, you see that it's a kombucha category, you need to make a kombucha drink, you end up doing this. And you have this idea that you're going to not have anything polarizing in it that makes a lot of sense as a way of like expanding it. And, and for people, I would guess, you know, your ideal type of consumer is somebody who has, you know, is interested in probiotics, has heard about them, wants to try them, but, you know, probably isn't going to go immediately to GT Dave, which looks like a hippie drink, <laughs> looking for something a little bit more approachable. So you have this idea of making this product. How do you end up testing that and validating that in the market and seeing, okay, this is actually true and this is working? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, there's a lot of quant and qual testing that we could do. And uh, I think at that time, I didn't do any of that. We, uh, I also had a, uh, a sort of yoga retreat center, meditation retreat center in Ojai. And so I would have a lot of that demographic, target demographic or psychographic that would come up there. So they were my, they were my guinea pig. So I would bring different flavors and drinks to them to see really what they, 
resonated with. We do uh, you know, almost like a consumer intercept with questionnaires and everything. So that was really the way that I, I got directional confirmation around flavor, organoleptics, et cetera. So it was really one-on-one or, you know, five on, you know, or a small group of folks that, that gave me their feedback in real time. So I did it. That makes sense. Okay. I want to talk about PepsiCo, you know, before we're going to talk about in a second, you know, the kind of transaction to ultimately sell Kavita to PepsiCo, but you talked about before you kind of hinted at just how difficult it is. So if we zoom out from Kavita, how difficult it is to get a strategic on your cap table as an entrepreneur or a founder, which is obviously very important. Talk about that and what it took to be able to get PepsiCo to say yes, to join, to invest, to become a part of the board. It takes a great product. They really got to believe in your capability and competency in making and scaling a product. So um, uh, that's the first part of any strategic interest. Obviously, they've got to see a trend where better for Pepsi Kale was seeing better for you. They are seeing fermented drinks. There's got to be a trend. So that's that's also uh, the piece. Look, I mean, it was really hard to get Pepsi came in. They had a great interest. They we had a term sheet, and they I just couldn't get them over the finish line. It was really a process. And I remember um, talking to my banker, Mike uh, Mike Bergmeier, over at Whipstitch, and he said, uh, yeah, I think it was he said to me, he goes, maybe we should go to Atlanta and talk to Coke. And I said, great idea. So we we went to Atlanta. We went to the corporate offices and presented to them. I got a term sheet from Coke. And as soon as I got a term, for, term sheet from Coke, I closed PepsiCo. So I think creating a dynamic where they know that you're, a, you're an opportunity and a commodity that they don't want to have slip to a competitor or, or it could fill their agenda. Like naked, um, PepsiCo had an initiative called Naked Emerging Brands, and they really wanted all their better for you sort of business to go through there. And they had a, they, they had a real uh, uh, corporate objective. And so really also working through and understanding your strategic investors, strategic uh, sort of uh, plan is really important so that you can continue to match and mold your core competencies to meet theirs. And during the, the, the PepsiCo investment where they put money in, they sat on the board and they, they provided a lot of strategic, uh, a lot of strategics provide strategic help and a lot of strategics just want to watch and monitor their investment. PepsiCo really wanted the team with us in ways that were really beneficial. And I, I really respect that in that organization. Uh, and they, um, and anyway, just getting aligned and understanding what it is that they, that, that they need and they want to see that suits them is really, was really part of uh, the development of the partnership. Yeah. I mean, this in, in many ways goes back to your idea that to be a great entrepreneur, you have to be a great promoter. And obviously, in this case, it took one deeply understanding their agenda, their strategy, how you were effectively going to kind of repeat their own language and, and, you know, ideas back to them. And then, you know, it totally makes sense. It's not surprising at all that going and getting a competitor's interest, you know, generates FOMO, generates this sense of, okay, you know, everybody thinks that this is a good investment. Do you want in or do you want out? You know, you have to be able to create some leverage. I, I want to talk, um, uh, about then. So you get PepsiCo on the board, they end up investing. How much time goes by until you start to explore, discuss the idea of a full acquisition? And was that a similarly trying process? And, you know, I know there's probably some, a, a lot of details potentially you can't share, but if you can share anything about that process, I think people would be interested. So it's interesting, you know, in the non-ALK world, and I guess to some extent in the ALK world, you know, the first thing that most strategics look look at is top line growth. What was really interesting about PepsiCo is that their valuation metrics dealt with top line growth. So what are you doing? What is the growth rate? And the multiple would be adjusted based on that. And that's kind of standard for, for most, but not all uh, CPG deals. One of the things that became really self-evident, even though it wasn't baked into, let's just say, our, our deal structure was, you know, EBITDA, cash flow, positive cash flow. And it was really amazing because we were pushing to drive top line while trying to maintain some business level of sustainability, but we weren't really concerned about 
operating deficit or losses because of the top line. But what was really, I think, amazing was when we brought in our own manufacturing capability, fermentation capabilities, and really created a great supply chain. A guy, Nate Patina, who, who came in and brought in John Ballas. I mean, these guys were just rock stars. Nate out of college and John out of other beverage companies. And I got to tell you, like creating a supply chain and an operational vehicle that could really bring your cost of goods down and, and really bring your gross profit margin up was everything. Because at the end of the day, when Pepsi, when it really came down to Pepsi, when they were getting really close, they wanted to make sure that we weren't going to bleed them much, you know. And so we ended up changing our strategy a little bit like has happened in other companies in today's environment where it may not be just about top line. It's about whether or not there's a sustainable business, especially if it's going to be used as a vehicle for future growth opportunities within that strategic um, you know, business umbrella. Yeah. I mean, in my experience, it's like top line is top line is very important because it it suggests directionally where the business is going. But top line without successful, you know, bottom line <laughs> profitability or just being revenue break even, re, you know, kind of revenue neutral um, is just very, very, very different because you can, you know, the world is full of companies that have amazing top line growth, but almost no shot in hell of ever being a profitable business. And so when you can have both of those, I think it, yeah, clearly it's a real business that has durability and it has a sense that it could get bigger and bigger and bigger. The last question I want to ask about Kavita is, for you, clearly, it's you found businesses, you scale them, you sell them. And so, you know, I imagine clearly from day one, the goal was always to sell Kavita. I, I still would guess that in the moment, as you're getting ready to do this, these nerves come up. Is this the right thing? Is this the right valuation? Walk us through that and how difficult or not difficult it was to eventually say yes to this offer and kind of complete the acquisition. There was a split on the board of directors. We had, I had a great board and uh, we were at that point in time uh, close to sustainability. So um, obviously how much more capital needs to go in the, into, the, into the enterprise is always a, a consideration. But, um, but I will say that uh, we, we were looking at our trajectory. We were growing at 89% when they approached us. And we had, a, we had a split board where they said, look, when you get a company that's scaling like this and you have this opportunity, you let it ride. Because going from $230 million that we sold it for to four to six, there's companies like Buy and others in the, in, in the beverage space that was selling around the same time, Core Water, they were letting it go. And, and we, we came to a place where we decided that PepsiCo's interest was, and they they really told us that like they're not they're not so open to letting this thing continue to go because they want to see room on they want they want to know that there's room to grow the business. They do their computation and their math and they say, look, if we're going to buy you for a quarter of a billion, we want to make sure that this could could generate an enterprise value of X or revenue base of X. So. So anyway, it was a really heated board dispute, but ultimately I went with uh, what my strategic wanted to do because the, you know, they say sometimes the first offer is the best. And when you've been working with somebody for so long in your company and you've, you've trusted to say no to them when they're ready to go and uh, then go shop or whatever, it's just not, just not a great thing to do. I think the better approach might be for some to not bring any strat on the cap table and then the not be governed by their wishes and their desires and the integrity of the partnership and then put it out for an open bidding process. So, um, you know, there's some pros and cons to both, both approaches. Yeah. I just want to ask one tiny little tactical question, which is, you know, clearly you brought up there, you, the rest of the board, you're clearly looking, you, you, you know a lot about Kavita, you know a lot about your business, you clearly know what PepsiCo's offering you, but there's always this tendency and it's, you know, almost impossible to fight to look outside and say, well, look at this company that's got this multiple. And one of the things I've seen is just that, you know, it's human nature, it's human tendency, but that ultimately there's nothing really valuable there and it ends up being destructive to get overly focused on other people. Do you have any thoughts on just how much you should be focusing on other businesses and their valuations and their metrics and how much you just have to put on blinders? I look at other businesses and what they're doing and how they're winning all the time. I mean, there's a couple of uh, companies in, in our space that have, uh, that have taken me to school. And, you know, some of these uh, entrepreneurs are half my age. And I look at it and I go, damn, like, you know, there's so much to learn. Times are changing so quickly. So 
I do look at other companies and I do look at what they're doing and I try to take the learning from them. But as it relates to, you know, their their strategic moves, eh, you know, uh, not really a driver for me, but certainly what they do on the brand side and product side, certainly something I pay close attention to. Yeah. You're always trying to learn tactics and you're trying to make sure that you're using those best in breed tactics. Makes sense. Okay, so I, I want to spend a little, uh, you know, a few minutes now kind of talking about these in-between years of, you know, selling Kavita. This is before you've kind of actually launched some of these first products with Flying Embers. And you're now doing some investing and advising. And, you know, I, I maybe just to start, I'll just kind of open it up to you. Talk about why you wanted to do that and what some of your hopes were for this kind of investing advising phase at that time. You know, it's interesting. I came out of uh, the transaction to uh, to PepsiCo wanting to have a fund and be a private equity investor and do that. Cause that was really goes back to my roots uh, on wall street. And I uh, joined a, joined a firm, a great firm, Clear Lake Capital. And they set up a separate platform for me to, to go out and look for deals and whatnot. And, uh, and great guys, hugely successful private equity company out of, out of Santa Monica. And I had that opportunity and I had my own platform and a, and a, and a, you know, hundreds of millions behind me. But what I realized was, uh, you know, working within an institutional confines, organizations, you know, you really don't, you really can't follow your your intuition as much as you'd like it. So after about 10, 11 months, you know, we parted ways in a healthy, in a healthy manner. And then I just jumped into a couple of deals that ultimately they didn't want to do because it was just too small for them. They're looking to put hundred million in a deal. This was a very big private equity company. And I realized that in CPG, you know, your first investment isn't a hundred million. And the scale that they were looking to do was, was, uh, was beyond my interest in entrepreneurial kind of uh, investing. So I went ahead and, uh, you know, a couple, a few of the companies that I, I showed them, I went ahead and uh, invested myself and brought some other more venture related capital into it. And, became a strategic advisor and really, really got involved uh, in that in that way at that time in a much smaller way than than running a private equity firm. I want to ask a question about what attracts you to companies and what you're looking for in order to invest and advise. And, and the reason I, I just want to set it up really quickly, the reason I'm so interested is one of the things I was that was fascinating to me as I was looking at your background is You've, you've built multiple successful companies. Kavita, Flying Embers is you know, doing great. Um, but all the companies you've invested in, I know them. They're brands that I love. And they're, they're brands that, to me, succeed because of that focus on product quality, taste, flavor first. Whether it's Iconic Protein, Wild Brands, Koya, Vive. So talk about, you know, as an investor, what are you looking for? What, is, what are the non-negotiables, the must-haves? And then what really gets you excited to be willing to jump into a company and a team? Let me use a couple of examples of, uh, of, of the companies that I got behind. Uh, with Wild Brands, um, there was this, for the first thing is, you know, is the product or the product prospect part of a growing trend? And do they have a major point of difference that is hard to replicate by the larger CPG companies? So with Wild, Jason was scrappy, hungry, type A, coming out of a tough reorg where some of his earlier products didn't work and he had and he had a new idea a new product which was a, a protein chip and it was a like a potato chip and it was a, but on trend was paleo on trend was i don't want to eat carbs i want to have protein and so you know out of that i saw a real opportunity to to have something that's really innovative that tastes great that could be on trend and nobody could replicate it anytime soon so sure enough we we went ahead and uh I invested and I got some private equity guys in, Carp Riley, who's been, Alan Carp, who's been an unbelievable partner with me on several, deal, several deals. And, uh, and anyway, that was really the point of difference and the opportunity there. And now, uh, some years later, they're, they're on fire, uh, Cro uh, Costco nationwide, uh, Kroger adoption. Uh, the product is amazing. And, uh, you know, we've got a big strat on the, on the, on the cap table and, and we're, and we're just looking, we're just growing the company. So that was, that was the unique aspect of that. I think with Koya, same thing, you know, you look at this product, which is a protein drink and it was a really great tasting protein drink. And Chris Hunter was this guy out of partner at Four Loco and what a, what a story and challenge they had and comeback and, 
he was one of the partners there and he was also had ties to my hometown and we met and talked, we connected. I said, this guy's a driver. This guy's a, this guy is not going to quit. And sure enough, some years later, Koi is uh, on their way to doing 40, 50 million in sales and has got these great product lines. One of the leaders in the, you know, challenging bolt house and naked emerging brands and everything. So, so again, another case where protein, better for you, low sugar, keto, all the attributes, but a great tasting product with a great leader. And then again, in an earlier segment, I was talking about uh, Five Organics, where, 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 where obviously immune shots were like happening and they had a, what, a, what an amazing opportunity when COVID came around. But when you, had a, when you have an entrepreneur that was so focused on attention to detail, that it was, it blew my mind that this guy didn't let anything go by. I mean, I think I'm an attention to detail guy and why it was just everywhere all the time. And again, great entrepreneur, great product, really served a niche where, you know, there was a huge need for immune support. And so sure enough, they transacted to Suja and, and uh, Payne Schwartz. So, so again, quality and conviction of entrepreneur, category on trend rising, points of difference that aren't easily replicatable. And I think that's really the, that's really the ingredients I look for in investing. Yeah, it's very well said. I mean, I think that we're definitely going to take a quote of what you said at the beginning, because I think it's a perfect formula and it takes some of those ideas of differentiation, but it makes it incredibly clear the type of differentiation you're looking for, I think is really interesting. I want to ask a question about iconic protein, um, you know, which you didn't cover there. And the question I'm curious is, so when I think about stuff like Koya, Wild Brands, they're somewhat novel or there's something new there that maybe doesn't, you're, you're not clear where, what category that goes in, or if it's in a category, it seems very different. When you look at something like protein drinks, you know, in some regards, you're like, one, there's not that many of them. <laughs> um, at least it doesn't seem like, you know, ones that sell incredibly well. How do you go about deciding, you know, what I guess to you stood out about iconic protein? And when you're, you know, looking at a somewhat crowded category, does that change your math, your computation at all? So Koya is plant-based on trend, small category. I mean, it's been growing quite a bit. Iconic is dairy-based. Uh, lactose-free, dairy-based, and so big category, dominated by old players. And so I, you know, seeing the protein trend, you know, I naturally was attracted to Billy and the Iconic team, and uh, and I saw the great size of the category and thought that we uh, could disrupt with innovation. But I will tell you, though, the challenge that we've had with Iconic is that you are in a category that isn't growing. You know, dairy-based protein drinks have been flat, uh, more or less flat over the last three, four years. So our challenge has been, how do you innovate within a category that isn't growing? And I think it's, it's posed some, some ongoing challenges where our top line has been relatively static for a couple of years now. But the thinking and the thesis was maybe overly confident that we could go into a really big category and create enough points of difference to change it. But at the end of the day, I think in traditional dairy-based protein, your consumer isn't really looking for adaptogens or maybe keto or maybe immune. They really are the insure or the boost that are just trying to get enough protein in a day because they're trying to just get through the day versus, you know, kind of go to the next level. And that was the learning there, but that was the rush. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It does seem like the protein category in a weird way is just like, I'm going to buy whatever has the highest protein count in it, <laughs> regardless of taste or flavor or quality. Certainly in the dairy-based space, uh, that's that's proven to be the, the case. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, I want to transition, obviously, to Flying Embers, which is the company that you've been building now. But I want to start with a bit of a tangent, um, which is around this idea of better for you category. And this is something, you know, before talking with you for deciding to do this interview, that had not been a term I had ever heard, this better for you category. And, you know, talking about it, I think you had a very clear, interesting way of describing what it was, but also this idea that it's actually been through multiple incarnations. There was kind of a 1.0, a 2.0. And, you know, you, you said at the time, you felt like we were in this kind of 3.0 now. Talk just about the category, maybe for people listening that don't have any context. What is it? Why does it matter? And then talk about that kind of one, two, three point kind of ch change. Starting in adult beverage or alcohol, 
you know, I think the white claws of the world, the hard seltzers were really better for you 1.0. And what that really involved was, um, you know, it wasn't something that was highly crafted, but it was something that had no gluten, wasn't heavy, low carbs, low sugar, and crushable. And that sort of feeling of lightness and, um, and sort of uh, vitality that you got out of something that was so light that had alcohol in it was 1.0 better for you. Um, you know, you fast forward a little bit, you, we, in the hard seltzer category, we had Vizzy, Molson Coors brand that came out with antioxidants and vitamin C. And I would say that that was 2.0, maybe 3.0. And of course, we also saw there to be an opportunity to go there with our hard seltzer, given that we had probiotic expertise. So we came out with antioxidants, vitamin C, and probiotics. But what we really learned was um, in, the bever in the adult beverage space, alcohol space, anything that starts to get a little too forward-facing, consumer messaging, health-oriented, or with even a halo really has really gets a lot of pushback, gets a lot of pushback from consumer advocacy groups. Um, the FDA hasn't really gone aggressive on folks like us, but we've had, you know, there has been a lot of class actions and a lot of um, just a lot of consumer groups that feel like maybe a more responsible approach since while we advocate drinking moderately, and with such moderate drinking, there could be some better for you attributes. At the end of the day, it was such a lightning rod and maybe justifiably so because alcohol is abused so much that anything that gave anybody that wasn't a responsible drinker reason to do more and drink more probably wasn't a great value proposition to have out there. So that was some of the learnings in going into, you know, better for you alcohol 3.0 that we have, we have wheeled back significantly recently. I want to ask how you feel about that, because, you know, hearing you talk about that to me, it just seems completely backwards where I, I think it's very fair to say consumers are going to drink. And I know many people that are either they don't want to drink or they're just being very conscious about what they're drinking when they're drinking. And so it feels weird to me to say these people can't have better options because they should just not drink when clearly the reality is they're just going to keep drinking. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, I have a personal passion around this ability to be have truth and label, transparency, veracity is really important. And there is, you know, there is research out there that does support moderate to light drinking could not necessarily be detrimental to you. In fact, could have some benefits. And that when you look at coming forth with a naturally fermented beverage that actually has real back, real functional beneficial bacteria and you can't point to that i'm not i'm not saying that it's gonna cure your digestion or or i'm not making any yeah you're not making those claims, claims but say, <laughs> saying what it is i find it to be completely frustrating and limiting but you know i think when you've got other stakeholders involved and a strategic involved and you know you've got like i I think that's a challenge. There are folks out there. I mean, look, there's leaders of the hard, the non-alcombucha space. I don't want to mention him, but who just take class actions as a course of business. It's a normal course of business. I'm going to take them on. I'm going to litigate them or I'm going to settle them. And they maintain their position of maybe aggressive consumer facing messaging. And some of them have built billion dollar brands doing that. Unfortunately, I think given you know, the dynamics that I'm in right now, I, that's not a fight I want to have, but it is super frustrating that, that there are advocacy groups out there and class action lawyers that, uh, that really inhibit you doing that. And I will say this, being someone that actually had a behavioral health digital media company that dealt with addiction issues as well at some one point in my life, I mean, being sensitive to that population group really is something that I'm mindful of and could and, and understand. 
No, I mean, very well said. It sounds obviously deeply frustrating. It's also reality. And as with anything in business, you have to make this risk reward calculation and it just doesn't feel like it nets out in a positive place for you to be able to do that. So, I mean, I understand it. Um, Okay. I want to talk about some of the things about the product that I think are just fascinating. And so before Flying Embers, you founded a company about two years before, and maybe you can clarify some of that timing. That, you know, is kind of R&D around fermentation. I think it was fermented sciences. Some of the questions I have is like, did you know that you were going to create a fermented cocktail? You know, did you know that that was the end goal? Or was this more set up to explore science and technology and how to develop products around fermentation? Fermented sciences was uh, really the genesis of it was in the R&D room at Cavita when we're, we, PepsiCo had already signed the documents. We had I don't know, two or three months of transitioning and we, we all sat around the room and we're like, hey, look, we do so much work to, on fermentation. I mean, the core competency around really unique ferments is really deep. So uh, we thought, why not go, why not go ahead and start? So we started a company, Fermented Sciences, and, and it really is still, it's the parent company, the holding company for Flying Numbers. But um, no, I had no no real visibility as to I'd eventually do a fermented can cocktail. And all I know is that I wanted to take all the learning, the years of learning in R and D and really take fermentation to another level and alcohol or non-alcohol. And, um, but yeah, you start with core competency and a vision and where the product ultimately develops and goes is, is a matter of fate and destiny in my mind. So. Yeah, it's very, well, it's very well said, especially for an entrepreneur that I think's made a, you know, kind of a fascinating fermented canned cocktail beverage. I want to talk for a second and just have you kind of describe what's different about your canned cocktails. Because number one, I think the biggest thing that I learned was there's actually no alcohol, which is obviously surprising. And that's because of the fermentation. Talk about just how different it is of a product from other canned cocktails. Yeah. First off is, you know, the research that we've, we did, we came back to realize that people that want to have a margarita uh, really want to want the taste of a margarita and then a little bit of something that might be better for you. Uh, the 1.0, I would say. And so what we looked at, we, we explored, uh, you know, doing spirit based margarita with tequila and a non spirit based margarita. And after the research came back, we were like, Hey, look, and, in a, in a majority of states in, in the United States, you can't put a spirit-based canned cocktail on the grocery shelf. And, and then you looked at the tax implications and you looked at all the other factors. And, and we went into R&D mode and we realized that with a particular unique fermentation that we use and with some innovative uh, fruits and juices, et cetera, we could make a margarita taste like a margarita. Uh, without necessarily having any tequila in it and not be faced with uh, tax implications and the limitation at shelf in many states. And, and so that's where we went. I think one of the unique things that I brought from winemaking was that I realized that barrel aging really does impart important flavor attributes. So in our uh, unique fermentation around this uh, mojito and margarita, we do barrel aging and we take tequila barrels and uh, rum barrels, and we use those, a particular toast or an, an organic offering uh, of barrels, and we, uh, and, we, and we do some toasting and we do some aging in that as well. So I think that really helps add a little additional craft to it uh, above and beyond the unique fermentation expertise that we use to do it. So, so that's why we decided to uh, go in. And when you think about trends and you know, rising tides lift all ships when we're looking at the hard kombucha category and realizing it's, it's growing, it's interesting. And it's, we think in the long run, it's always going to have a place. We have a national footprint. We have, we have people went from Florida to Chicago, to New York, to Washington, to Texas. And we built this national. And all of a sudden, when you see that the liquid going through the pipeline isn't enough to keep that uh, that that burn or reduce that burn, we realized we had to come out with something that we saw was the beginning of a trend, not something that was at the top of the trend. Uh, like I think I mentioned you earlier about the hard seltzer. And uh, we thought that we had a point of difference enough that we could enter, even though all the big guys from Boston Beer to AB are all coming out with something similar. And um, yeah, that was the rationale for moving into that uh, product line. Yeah. I mean, the barrel... 
uh, that my guess is that that is the difference maker and that consumers can taste that and that it actually feels like a premium beverage because I think my experience with a lot of canned cocktails is it's just disappointing. It's like 10 to 20 percent less as good as a cocktail that somebody made you at the counter because it just doesn't have any of those crafted elements. So I love that idea, that approach. You know, totally. I, I think that. And and we have, like I said, there's there's some unique fermentation processes that, that it's not just a pure sugar brew that some other folks do. So, so uh, I think we nailed it. Uh, early indication out of Texas, you know, we got uh, a lot of HEB uh, uh, stores and the velocity is, uh, is really strong. So we're, we're, we're excited about the opportunity. That's exciting. I want to ask one more question, which is, you know, have you, so it feels like there's a tailwind behind this. As you came out with this, were you more encountered with skepticism and what the heck is this? And, you know, just like you need to educate the consumer and people maybe are open to experimenting, but they're not quite ready yet. Like how how easy was it and how quick did you see adoption and did you feel any friction? With consumers, it's been pretty quick. I mean, there hasn't really been any, I mean, all the consumer adoption everywhere we go has been pretty quick and rapid. I think really the taste is great. Zero grams of sugar, zero carbs, organic, you know, full flavored, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, and the price is right. It's a six pack variety. So I think we, we kind of, we kind of nailed all that. We got all that lined up. Um, retailers as well, you know, retailers are, you know, we're early enough. One of the things that was a discussion with our board and our strat was, are you moving too fast? Because, you know, um, we might have moved too fast into the hard seltzer category and lost our footing a little bit on the hard kombucha. So, you know, again, we had to really rationalize that if we're really going to make a play as a small company, we really got to get on shelf sooner because once everybody else is on shelf, we're not going to get on. So we got to get on. We got to be an incumbent, not a not necessarily a challenger brand to a lot of existing. So we really had to sell the board and our strategic with really going there when there was some some resistance and justifiably so. So a lot of work to create the product, a lot of work to test the product, to validate the product, and then a lot of work to to get the board and the financial community to step up to put more money in to really uh, drive the drive the product uh, nationwide. Yeah. Yeah. I want to close out by just asking some advice and and talking about some lessons learned, you know, and because there are definitely founders, entrepreneurs listening to this that are inspired by what you've built. Um, so the first question I want to start with is just what advice you would give to founders working in the food and beverage space? And, you know, what, and I think maybe another way of framing that is what have you learned the painful way <laughs> that you can help people save time and, you know, have a less painful journey? So I'm a product and business person, right? I never really, I think, uh, appreciated the value of building brand earlier on. And I think what 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 what, rec- what I regret and what I would recommend going forward is that anybody going into food or or beverages begin to look at their early business model with bringing influencers in that could help amplify the brand and define the brand to the target audience. A couple competitors in the space have done that superlatively. And we are now, we have a strategic partnership with UTA and we have brought them in, investors, et cetera. Now we're working and, and hustling to get those influencers so that we could we could really get out there. And what, what we also learned is that user-generated content or influencer content is really what matters in this space. And we, we spend a lot of time and money doing our own content, but what consumers really want to see is an endorsement. They don't want to see another brand trying to pitch their stuff to them because it's 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 really uh, it's really been saturated. So, I would say that one thing, bringing them in and having a structure on your cap table where they invest or you take a share of equity or options and bring them in, is really a critical piece in today's brand building. That I don't think you could win fast enough without that piece of uh, strategic relationships. Yeah. I want to ask just one clarifying question there. You know, you clearly talked about that part of this is obviously just marketing through testimonials. So it's people saying, I love this. It's someone you respect, someone you follow. You're you're clearly going to be interested. But you also used a really interesting word, which is helping define a product for consumers that seems really interesting to me. Talk about that angle and I guess how influencers can help even, I guess, just educate consumers and not just kind of telling them to buy it. I mean, I think the way that they speak of it organically, right? It's not like, hey, it's like it works into their into their daily routine and then they'll, well, you know, it's just so much more. But, you know, we think we know how to speak to consumers as brands, but they're, they're not really, uh, they're not our consumers 
yet. And yet we're, we're thinking maybe somewhat arrogantly that we know exactly what to say to them because we think we know them and that's their, you know, and we do the research to say, oh, they're interested in this, this, and this. But ultimately, there's a different way in. And, and the way into consumers, when you have an influencer that has a million, five million, whatever it might be, followers, they already understand the language. They already have perfected the form of communication. And the nuances of speaking about anything, particularly a product, is so um, unique to that audience that only they know that language and we don't. So I think that's what I'm really trying to get to. There is a language to communicate to a target audience that unless you've already engendered them as part of your ecosystem, you're a fish out of water trying to break through that way. Yeah. Well, it's another, I mean, another way of saying that is I feel like, comp, you know, it's great to have a marketing department. Every company needs a marketing department. There's a certain speak and language that seems to emanate from marketing departments that can all, almost be like just a non-even form, human form of communication, where when you hear an influencer or just somebody talk about the product, you're like, oh, wow, this is such simple language. And yet it's so clarifying and you remove all the jargon, all the kind of bullshit. <laughs> really important, I think, in, built, in brand building today. Yeah. I want to ask one uh, more closing question, which is just the biggest lessons you feel like you've learned it looking back. And so now the question I want to ask is, as you kind of look back and string together Kavita, Koya, you know, Wild Brands, uh, the companies not only you founded, but that you've invested in, what are the biggest lessons that you've learned? And maybe part of it's just as an investor, not as a, as a founder, an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's always going to take more money than you think. <laughs> That's the first thing. I mean, really, I mean, it's... Uh... And I can't underscore that. Like, you know, even the best of plans in this space are, you know, don't, you know, it's one in a million that really exceeds the business plan. So, you know, really preparing for the long haul. And if it's a capital intensive business where you're bringing in your, you're building your own manufacturing, et cetera, just know that it's going to take more money than you think. I think the other thing that really has been a learning for me at my life stage with my career is that. Sometimes being successful and being known as a successful entrepreneur and businessman affords you a lot of capital that, that isn't necessarily best for the business. And I think there's something super valuable about a business that is scrappy, where you have entrepreneurs that are living in a not so opulent way. Uh, and that level of hunger and tenacity and scrappiness, I think really translates into ideation, innovation. I don't know what a special sauce. And so I would say that success doesn't always breed success, but sometimes success could be, you know, a great experience to pull from, but, you know, when you have an opportunity with success to raise a lot of money from a lot of folks, it doesn't always translate into the best model to win. And that's something that I've learned. Yeah. I mean, I love that insight. And I love that idea that, you know, you could raise, you know, an abundant amount of capital, but ultimately the better thing net net is to have a business that biases towards scrappiness, towards constraints, towards, you know, kind of creative constraints. I love that point. Thank you so much for the time. This has been so much fun. I highly encourage everyone listening to go and try Flying Embers. Thanks for coming on, Bill. Thank you very much. <laughs>